as a journalist, I had seen a kind of exodus while I was covering Rohingya. That was totally different level. But here it was like how people who had come and left their home to get some uh, better life were actually running away from it. And most of them said that they will never come back to the city. The, the kind of pain the city was giving to them, uh, they were being looked upon. Uh, of course, there were a lot of organizations which were trying to help them also in terms of food and water. But uh, but the way these migrant workers were, were treated uh, by, uh, unfortunately, the population or the residents of the city was... Well, sometimes, a lot of times I saw it, it was not, not, a, not a good way to treat some other human well, being. Well, everybody was uh, concentrating on the deaths in the metropolis, like Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, or Calcutta. I wanted to see like what, what's happening in the hinterland, or what's happening in the countryside. So it was a challenge because nobody had, because I was sitting in Delhi, the flights had started, uh, domestic flights had started, but I didn't want to take any risk. So I took a, a journey to the eastern part of India, a state called Bihar, which has the worst uh, doctor-to-patient ratio, I think, in the world. It's like one doctor for almost 26,000 people. I wanted to see like, what, what's happening uh, uh, in states like these, uh, where a lot of migrants have come. There is nothing. No rules are being followed. And... The cases are not rising so much as we expected, but what's happening? We were only getting the coronavirus pandemic picture only from metropolises, and I think it was very important to to showcase what's happening in rural. Nina told about like very important part about this pandemic. Uh, unfortunate part is that like it is taking away people, but the most unfortunate is like I have covered wars and all, but like. Uh, there is no dignity in death in wars. Uh, but here, there was no dignity in death in, in your own city, in your own country, which was not actually at war, but it was at war. It occurred to me that all over the city, there was you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people stuck at home just watching TV. New Yorkers live on top of each other. In Manhattan, we're stacked 72,000 people per square mile. We like it that way. Social distancing is for the suburbs. But the virus has put us all in our little cages, alienated, anxious, our eyes stuck in our TVs and screens. New York City, maybe unlike other major sort of European capitals, for instance, has an enormous unsheltered population. It is one of the most glaring aspects of the class inequity that you see across America, but particularly in New York City, because the wealth is so enormous. And so the poverty is also so enormous. So I venture downtown at night to the financial district. It's silent and ghostly, a homeless man wrapped in a white sheet, a lone jogger. Many of the wealthy have fled, choosing to ride out the pandemic elsewhere. The emptiness feels like the weeks after September 11th, but instead of ash in the air, I smell Purell on my hands. It was very difficult uh, for photojournalists to maintain social distance. It just goes against everything that we've learned. It's 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 like so counterintuitive, and um, and occasionally I'd see a, a photographer back with a long lens, and and you know I dart in and then and leave, and you kind of figure that all the nurses there were probably COVID positive. So I I wore a mask. I. I was wearing gloves and I didn't really see any reason to wear gloves. I was washing my hands constantly. Yeah, and as all of us were, you know, super hypersensitive to any small little sniffle or cough, which became almost impossible to handle, you know, mentally. Um, yeah, but, but colleagues of mine who were covering COVID wars and ICU units and um, friends of mine who were doctors and physical therapists were, of course, all, you know, uh, masked up and um, protective eye gear and coverings and would, you know, get out of their clothes uh, as soon as they walked in the door and things like that. I was very, very lucky that just before, like six or seven months before, before pandemic in India, I actually am the only journalist in India, probably the only journalist in India who is trained in infectious disease coverage training, which is given by professional doctors. So I just had that training um, like I would say six months before the 
pandemic hit. Of course, we didn't know what would happen in the next six months. It was more for my planning to go to Africa for Ebola, which was much more deadlier, I believe, in terms of death rate. So, of course, I was uh, somewhere outside the country while I was having training and was being trained by the doctors. And the training also taught me how to protect myself, but it also put a sense of fear in a way, which is, was good because I think uh, it's always good to have a sense of fear when we are covering these kind of conflict, I would say, uh, or these kind of, uh, because it, it makes you think that you are also vulnerable. So I knew like, what is the boundary which I should not cross? And of course, uh, if whenever I was going into red zones or like ICUs or high risk areas, which we call, I was always uh, uh, having conversation with my security folks. Once you are dead, this has to be some dignity. But I think coronavirus took away the dignity also in terms of dead people. The thing is that slowly and slowly, uh, these dead people are just becoming numbers. It is becoming part of data. And uh, uh, I thought about it a lot and like I wanted to give uh, in a way like some faces to the numbers and we just did this project. And we just did a project of India is about to hit 100,000. Case uh, 100,000 cases, death cases in a couple of days, and we are releasing this set of pictures, which includes people who have died, and the phones are being held by their immediate family members. It includes young people, old people, people from all religions, people from all caste, professionals like doctors, architects, police, you know. So we wanted to show that we wanted to actually give back some dignity. I, I personally wanted because of after covering so many funerals and and so many uh, <clears throat> ceremonies at the graveyards. I, for me, I of course never saw the face of the victim, but for I just wanted to give it a kind of little dignity back to them, and I wanted to show that these were the real people who were behind the numbers. This was actually an internal struggle within the union, the nursing union, about the leadership also of the union. And um, so for journalists just to show up, because these, these were, some of these were sanctioned by the union, these protests, some of them were not. For journalists just to show up to acknowledge that these stories are, are real, nurses were holding like impromptu memorial services in front of hospitals for their coworkers. And so my role in that moment is to, to document, to tell that story, to kick it out on social media so they, their, their message can be amplified. Well, I think it's a profession for people who um, definitely want to live in a social context people who want to analyze, experience, be compassionate, um, be engaged in the world around them. And so that I think is the, the most important part. You have to be willing to open yourself up and to also be a good listener and to know why it is that you wanna be there. It's not, for a, it's not a casual thing. It's a serious profession. And so, you have to be willing to do the work to get the respect and trust of people. As Danish said, it's an honor to tell their stories. And so you, um, you have to be seriously serious minded. And it's, it's not, um, although it occasionally may seem like it's somehow weirdly glamorous, it is not a glamorous profession. It is very much a serious, hardworking, physical, phys like uh, um, challenging physical profession but one that um, has been very meaningful, um, meaningful to the people that, that are in the pictures you make, meaningful in terms of the colleagues and the support in the community. And also, you, I think everyone I know who goes into this profession wants in some ways to see a better world. And I think that's actually very important. 
I think the right now uh, that in the coming time there would be need for more photojournalists or visual historians, as I call them. And I can assure you that the job will be much, much more difficult in the times to come. But uh, especially it will be difficult for the photographers or the journalists or the news photographers or photojournalists who would be on the front lines, whether it's COVID, where you are exposed every day to the unknown enemy or to whatever protests which are happening or how the things are changing in this world. And also the biggest challenge is like people are getting flooded every single day with avalanche of pictures on social media and whatever things they consume, you know, there's just pictures, pictures, pictures coming in. So it will, it, it, it's a big challenge for people who would be entering this field and how to make their work stand out. I think it will require new ideas, not the cliche ideas won't work anymore. And of course, the new execution, execution styles, I would say, to catch the attention of the consumers. And of course, without compromising at all with the ethics of journalism. So that is very important. Uh, so, but I can assure the students who want to take up this profession that, at least in my experience, is one of the best professions. It's, uh, I would not say that for other, for me, it's monetarily okay, but not always monetarily uh, such a uh, great profession. But the most important thing is to tell other people's story. It is an honor, uh, which very few people get in this in this world and it also comes with a lot of responsibilities and i can assure you if we if we all uh, the, these coming these students who take up sports and they perform their duties well uh, with keeping all the ethics and journalism they can have always have a good night's sleep